I am amazed at how many people stop me out in the hallway and ask me, is your wife aware of the way you talk about her? <laughs> no. <laughs> she thinks I'm a bricklayer. <laughs> well, honey, I'm off to Ohio to build another home. <laughs> well, God blessed me with a wonderful woman. And uh, I got to tell you, I was in, asked in an interview recently, uh, what is it I love most about my wife? And... Uh, that's one of those questions that sound on, on its surface a pretty uh, banal question and, and, and trite. And you give it some thought, and if every man would take the time to think about that, what is it you love most about her? Certainly after 20 years, um, I have to say that uh, this woman has seen just about every demon that I have to offer. I hope she's seen them all. And she still continues to lay next to me at night and, and profess her love for me. And uh, you can't buy that. That is a, an absolute gift of grace from a... a, from a, a, a another human being and uh, it wasn't always um, I, I remember somebody asked me how does an atheist from the south side of Chicago wind up living in Nashville Tennessee as a born-again Christian working churches I was at a church last night in New Albany and in Nazarene from from clubs like this and from Vegas casinos and from Atlantic City and and how do you wind up working churches and uh I got to tell you, 25 years ago when I started comedy in Chicago, I, this was the, la the last place I expected to ever be is in front of a church and uh, professing a faith in God, certainly. And what happened was I crawled into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting 17 years ago, and all I wanted to do was stop drinking. That was it. That was my goal in life, was to stop drinking and try to be a civil human being to my family. I was not a nice man. Trust me. Let's just say I was an angry, bitter, jaded, cynical man, just not nice. And I was harder on my family than anybody. I wasn't nice to many of you people, but I was harder on my wife and kids. And they told me to pray to a God, and they said, pray to this God. And I said, I don't believe in God. And they said, well, find something in this universe that's bigger than you. And I got to tell you, as broken as I was and beat up as I was, that was the hardest thing I had to do was find something larger than me in the universe. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, it's just how the human ego can be so large. And I could not get on my knees. I would not get on my knees and pray to anything. But God has his own plans. And I mean, I've loved the term, hound of heaven. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's when God pursues his own. And he'll pursue you if he wants you. And the only, pay, the only motivator he has for you to get to look heavenly and get on your knees is pain. Unfortunately, that's his only way of getting your attention. And he took away everything that I thought I valued. Everything. And after seven or eight years on that journey, and I read a lot of books. I read all the self-help books I could get. I was... Uh, you know, reading Ayn Rand and, and, and trying, to, trying to get a hang on to something to make me a better human being. I really was. I was trying as hard as I could. I went to therapy, talked to people about my anger, my rage, I mean, all this stuff, and it just it wasn't working. I went through my whole life trying to feel like I belonged on this planet somewhere, and it just wasn't working. And God puts people in your lives. And trust me, if you're on a journey, pay attention to the people you come. Even the guy that hits you with his car is maybe there for a reason, you know? <laughs> And I met some interesting people when I look back on this. God put a man in my life who was doing comedy for 100 bucks a week. The guy was worth, I don't know, four, five, six million dollars. Sold his business, made millions of dollars. Just wanted to go on the road and do comedy. He was 50-some years old. Wasn't a very good comic. <laughs> but <laughs> he didn't have to be. I mean, he had all the money he ever needed. He's the only guy that we ever worked with that pulled into the jobs with a 450 SEL Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming in on the Greyhound, you know. <laughs> yeah, hey, how are you? I'm your headliner for the week. I make the big money. How are you? But God knows his own, man, and he knew I wouldn't talk to this man. I, I was a shallow, vacuous, empty vessel. I really was. And I didn't have anything to talk to this man about until I found out because of his wealth, he had access to some of the nicest golf courses in America. He was actually a member of Mirfield Village here, and uh, that's all I needed to hear. He was my new best friend. <laughs> What I didn't know about him was he was a fundamentalist Christian, and I didn't know that. And we're sitting on the fairway one day just talking. And we're talking about life. We're talking about this. We're talking about that. And then he brings up the Bible. And I said, ah, don't give me the Bible. I don't want to hear the Bible. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that garbage. And he says, well, what is it about the Bible you don't think is true? And I said, I don't know. I never read it. And he said, well, you're not an atheist. You're a moron. <laughs> And I have to tell you, I would have hit him, except that I would have lost access to Muirfield Village. And I wasn't, wasn't going to do that. 
And I asked him to explain himself, and he said, well, to be honest with you, a true atheist is not only a biblical scholar, but is scholarly in all the face of the earth. And after a long intellectual journey, has come to the conclusion that there is no God of the universe. You, on the other hand, want to circumvent the entire intellectual process and just come to the conclusion that there's no God. That's lazy and moronic. I didn't know what to say. So at the end of the week, he said to me, there's a guy in Denton, Texas, a man named Tom Nelson. He said he teaches the Bible the way I think you would like it taught. And, he, and, and uh, I'd like to sign you up for some study tapes. And I said, will it cost me anything? And he said, nope. Uh, and I said, well, then knock yourself out. I'm not paying a nickel for that. And then he said, can I send you a Bible? And I said, hey, I've tried reading them. And believe me, I did. I opened them up in hotel rooms. I had read somewhere the Bible was the living, breathing word of God. I didn't get it. I'd open it up, look at it. Come on, you know, do something for me. I'd read, I couldn't get it. I didn't understand it. So he sends me the tape, sends me the Bible, time goes by, and God implodes my life. He was imploding my life. My marriage was falling apart. I couldn't deal with my life. I, honestly, I tried. I, I, I'm telling you, if there was a book out there that I could have read that would have given me the tools that I needed to function in this life, I would have gotten it because I, I, had, I have stacks of them, and I couldn't figure out how to make my wife happy. That was all I wanted was to make her happy. I could, I, we quit fighting. If you think acrimony is bad in your marriage, wait till you get to apathy. Apathy is the absolute worst. It's not even a feeling. It's just this, we couldn't even deal with each other in the hallway. We would like sneak by each other and, and, and we're sleeping in the same bed and, and I'm reading and, and my back is to her. She's watching TV or the nights she would read, I'd watch TV. I mean, this is our life together. And somehow we're, tr we're getting through day to day, but I don't know how. And we're in a parking lot at Toys R Us, and she says, you want a divorce? That's what she said to me. Do you want a divorce? We're buying toys for Christmas. And that's how she said it, as if you want to take out the trash. We've gotten to a point in our marriage where there's no emotion, there's no life, there's no nothing. We're soul dead people. And she looks at me and says, you want a divorce? This is the most life-altering decision a man and woman will ever make. You know, the culture wants to tell us that it doesn't mean anything. Just go to get, get your divorce, it's quick, it's painless, and move on with your life. It doesn't work that way. It is the most painful. When the Bible says you're one flesh, it is literally, that's what it feels like. And that's what we went through. We basically went through the pain of ripping our flesh apart. And this is what she asked me. You want to, and all I could think to say was, yeah, if that's what you want, I turned the car back down. That was how we decided to get a divorce. I mean, I look back on that time and I just go, wow. Who were those people? We now, we look at that and we go, who were those people? But God has to move you to a place, a place where you can pay attention. It has to all go away. You have to give it all up before he can work the restoring process. So I went home, and it says in the Bible, what Satan intends for evil, God will use for good. My biggest character flaw is procrastination. And Tammy had put it on me to fill out the divorce papers. <laughs> and it wasn't like, you know, we, we had anything to salvage. I figured, you know, I'll fill them out. But I got thank you cards from 1988 I haven't mailed, you know, so... <laughs> so I just went home, and I said, yeah, okay, we'll get around to it. And I had moved into the guest room, you know. And this is how we were living. I'd go on the road, do my comedy, and I'd come in and moved into the guest room. And we, you know, we're raising these kids, and, and we're, we're existing. And as God would have it, he moves this woman into my wife's life. My wife shows dogs for a living, and she's at a dog show, and this battered woman shows up. She's just beat, and Tammy says, you can't go back to that man. And, and, and she says, I got nowhere else to go. And Tammy says, well, we have a guest room. She gives the woman my room, and i got to move back into the bedroom. And now we have a chance. This is an opportunity now. We have given up. We have let go of everything, and now we're going to talk. And believe me, it was difficult. I, there was a point after a couple nights I looked at her. She wouldn't even look at me. I was talking to her back for two days. I mean, you know, I'd say something, and she, she, I finally walked over across the room and put my hands on her shoulders, and she flinches, and she just, she says, no, I, don't, I can't. I said, will you look at me? She said, I can't. How do you get to a place in your life with someone that you love? I know I love this woman. I know I do. I had therapists tell me I love her. For God's <laughs> sakes, I love this woman. And we're at a point we can't even look at each other. She says, I can't. I just, I, Jeff, I just fill out those papers. I just want to get this. I want to get it over with. 
And that was what I, I just, okay. I went out in the kitchen, and, you know, filling them out. And there was nothing to give away. We lost it all in a bankruptcy. I mean, we, we lost it all, everything. And we're on our way to divorce court to file the papers. A few days later, whatever, we're filing the papers. We're 10 minutes from filing the papers in Maricopa County to, to end this part of our lives. And that little voice, that little quiet voice that God puts in us. And sometimes you've got to shut the TVs off and the stereos off and all these other things off to hear it. But it said something to my wife. I don't know what it said. But all I know is she said, pull the car over. And I said, for what? She says, I've I, I got to rethink this. This is a two-year process, man. Two years of letting go of this woman. And I'm telling you, it was, it was, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I don't know if any man in this room knows what it's like to wake up in the morning with so, so much anxiety. As soon as your eyes pop open, it's just like the world caves in on you. And you walk around and you just want to know where it's coming from. I said it would have been so much easier if I woke up in the morning and some man just started beating me with a stick. At least I knew where the pain was coming from. And people would go, why are you so miserable? Because he keeps hitting me. <laughs> My wife would ask me, why are you so miserable? And I'd go, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be. I don't know. She goes, why can't you enjoy your job? I go, I don't know. What's the point? What is the point? Don't you care? There's a point? There's a purpose to this? And my wife would go, no. I just want my family. Ten minutes from divorce court, she says, pull over. I can't. I, I want to rethink it. And I said, babe, if you're, you're in this, you're in for the long haul, I can't, I can't be playing this anymore. I can't. Let's just cut it and go. She says, no, Jeff, I don't know why. I don't know why. We know why now, but we didn't know then why. But anyway, we go home. Eight months goes by. It's not getting much better. It's getting a little better. It's not much. She comes to me, and she says, I'm going to Ohio with the kids. And I said, we can't afford to go to Ohio. She says, you're not invited. And I said, well, how are you going to get there? She says, my father's going to pay for the trip. We're taking the boys, and we're going for the summer. And she says, while I'm gone, you're going to get your life together. I'm coming up on my 40th birthday, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just, I have no clue. I have no idea. I went to Domino's Pizza to get a job to deliver pizzas, and they wouldn't hire me. You want to talk about humbling. You have a 40-year-old man with a mortgage and kids and wife, and you figure, I'm lowering myself to get this job. And the kid looks at my application and says, comedian, that's it? That's the only job you've had? And I said, yeah. He said, what do you want me to do with this? And I said, you know, we're not splitting atoms. We're delivering pizzas, for God's sake. <laughs> Apparently, my interviewing skills had suffered over the years, too. <laughs> But it was like, my God, don't make me beg for a job p delivering pizzas. I go home and tell my wife I'm unemployable. I can't take it anymore. You know, anyway, she packs the kids up. And before she leaves, she grabs these tapes that I've been collecting. And she puts them in a pile. And she says, you either listen to these things or I'm throwing them out. And again, I had no reason to say, keep them. I hadn't listened. I hadn't even thought about them in a year and a half, two years. I don't know. I'd just been collecting them and throwing them on the different houses. And that little voice, the little quiet voice says, yeah, leave them there. Put, leave them in the, on the floor. I'll, I'll get to them. I don't care, you know. And a few days goes by, I'm walking by the tapes, and I said, you know, little voice says, open one up. And I said, okay, I start to walk, and another voice says, well, for what? There's nothing in there for you. Nothing. And then that starts, that whole dialogue of what's in there, I want to get it, I want to get it. When I read about demonic realms and angelic realms in, in the Bible, I, I went right back to this moment in my life. Because it was a struggle to get in there, because something knew what was in them things. And I ripped one open, I finally got over that after five minutes. You know, I'm 40 years old, and I'm having an argument with myself in the front room. I used to say that's why I got drunk in the morning, it was crowd control, you know. <laughs> But I just, <laughs> maybe I am nuts. I don't know. But I'm trying to get into this. I rip one open. I throw them on the floor. And I, and I, and I, and I go there. You know, there's a couple tapes. And I go, all right, what, what am I going to do now? Pick one up, Ecclesiastes. And I couldn't even pronounce it. It was Ecclesiastes or whatever. I said, I don't know what this is. I got to get that Bible. Where's that Bible? Oh, it's in the junk drawer. That's where I left it. So I pulled the Bible out of the junk drawer. I put the tape into the machine. And I started listening to this pastor from Denton, Texas, talk about what Solomon, Solomon, this, this wise old man, 78 years old, wrote Ecclesiastes at the end of his life about life on earth. And it starts out with meaningless, meaningless. It's all meaningless. That got my attention. Boom. Because that's the way I felt. I couldn't find anything worth meaning in this, in this earth. Really, nothing. Not in career, not my wife, not my kids, not my cars, not my home. Nothing. And he starts talking about it. And basically Solomon's conclusions were that life without God will have no meaning. And I didn't understand that. And as he began to explain about the creation, in order to enjoy the creation, you have to know the one that created it. And, and, and if happiness were an act of will, we'd all be happy. Because that's basically what we want out of life. Everybody wants to be happy. You ask them. So if it was an act of human will, why aren't we happy? We're the most medicated species on the planet. We really are. 
And what it is, what I found out, what he said was something has to come outside of us, inside of us, change our hearts, and then work its way out through the, through the act of service to others. And I was blown away. For the first time in my life, I heard something that made sense. And I believe it was because that day God chose to turn it on inside me. That was the light switch. Bam, it went on. And I was like, wow, this, this is it. This is what I was looking for. I wanted purpose. I wanted some reason to get up in the morning and put one foot in front of the other. And then I said, without God, I have no, well, how do I get God? So I opened another tape, put another tape, another tape, another tape, because I'm a compulsive, addictive personality. I was just, I mean, I'm not kidding you, man. And I'm making notes in my Bible, and I'm going like, man, this is the greatest stuff I've ever heard. At one point, I wanted to run on my lawn and hold the Bible up. Have you read this thing? Wow, what a book. Man, this is amazing. Wow. And I don't know why, I don't know why it was 40 years or whatever. I mean, this was a 13-year journey up to this point. I'm not telling you, this did not come overnight. I didn't get the road to Damascus epiphany that Paul got. I'm telling you, man, I sought this. And I went out and I laid in fetal position. I used to go to the desert and scream up at God, all right, if you're up there, show me, you know. And I mean, it was today, that day, bam. And I'm listening to these tapes, and then he gets to the Jesus that he knew. The one he says, he says, he says he was, he was at a prison. And I'll never forget this line. I love this line. He was at a prison doing a sermon, and he said to the prisoners in this prison, he said, I would not walk across this stage to tell you about my religion, Christianity, but I will crawl on my hands and knees through broken glass to hell and back to tell you about the love of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I heard that as a man. As a man, I said, that's what I want. I want something. I want something that I want to die for. I believe this, that a man is not, and I'm talking about a man, I'm not a woman, but I'm a man, and I said a man is not fully alive till he has something in his life that he's willing to give his life up for. And I'd like to think I'd give my life up for my wife and kids, but I'll tell you something, I'll give my life up now for my Savior and my right to profess this faith because I'm telling you, it transformed my life.